hundreds of trillions of microbes in us that are actually controlling us. There's a gut-brain axis, they control our thoughts, believe it or not, our moods, behaviors. The bacteria control the integrity of the lining of the gut. And so when you do not have proper integrity, the bacterial you mentioned is endotoxin, can actually leak into the bloodstream and signal an inflammatory response the eating late and the gut clock is kind of our bodies go through a circadian rhythm of just cleansing the upper digestive tract and sweeping everything kind of towards the end if you're eating late you're going to stress the body's systems to digest and clear that food before you go to bed the um, polyphenols in particular are prebiotic they help build up and biodiverse the microbiome and for example, a lot of the fruits like the berries in particular that I emphasize throughout the phases is that they're low glycemic and that they will, with their phytonutrients, fight disease, prevent cancer, and enrich the microbiome all in one. Welcome back, everyone. It's Mike Mutzel here with HighIntensityHealth.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we're live with Dr. Gerard Mullen. He's the author of a couple great books. The first one is The Inside Track and his new book right here, The Gut Balance Revolution, which I would encourage you to check out. We're going to dive into the details about his book with him today and talk about SIBO. Uh, gut bacteria, um, gut inflammation, weight loss, a bunch of these different complex topics that are so pervasive in our society. And he's a perfect one to do this with because he's a board certified gastroenterologist and associate professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins University. So Dr. Mullen, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. I think a great starting point, Dr. Mullen, would be sharing your personal story and your weight loss journey and how you realized that there was more going on than just uh, calories in, calories out, and over-exercising and under-eating. So let's kind of talk about your weight loss journey and your uh, profession in gastroenterology. Yeah, I was, I was a heavy kid, mainly in, in uh, high school, not so much in uh, grade school, and not really clear why but then, but now it's clear to me now why that was so. And so there was a day I went to the doctor's office with my mother for mononucleosis, right? <clears throat> and you know, that condition, you get a sore throat, you don't feel well. So I had lost maybe, you know, five or six pounds, maybe, you know, over a week. And then she was very concerned the fact that I wasn't eating. So this guy turned around as he was, as she, he was walking out, looked at her like, you got to be kidding. And then looked at me and just said, right, it may make a dent if you lost more weight, you know, hurt him. And just kind of like, just, just the mannerisms were very telling. So that was like an aha moment for me is kind of like, you know, well, he has a point, not, you know, not the nicest guy to emulate, but he had a point. And, and the point was, is that if I want to do something with my life, I can't carry that kind of weight around. And so I start searching for a solution. Right. And so I started getting into fiber. I started getting to yogurt, especially. I really didn't even know what yogurt was uh, until I was uh, late in my teenage, teenage years. And I started getting into what is, is now the gut balance revolution. But I started getting into feeding my microbiome years ago with just little things that were available to me that I'd read about. And it was about pre and probiotic foods. And uh, so the weight just kind of I lost it like a bad habit. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I love it. And and since then, you've been encouraging a lot of your clients and patients to do the same thing and to rethink how they look at weight loss. And so we talked about that uh, earlier, that we used to think that eating a low glycemic index diet, the way that it changes your metabolism is by, because it's not spiking blood sugar, but you talk about in your book, the real way that these high fiber uh, high plant-based diets change your metabolism and cause you to lose weight is because they're changing your gut ecology. So maybe you can speak about uh, how the food is affecting our gut ecology, then how that is affecting our ability to burn or store fat. Very good uh, question. The fact is that the gut microbes in us are the ones that ultimately determine our metabolism, our set point. And that's only come to light over the last five years or so due to the explosion in research since the Human Microbiome Project. And so what's really happening is that we have these foods that we think are just calories in, calories out. And what they're actually doing is they're actually changing the populations of bacteria so that they're more biodiverse and that they thrive and they in turn 
signal our gut hormones, they signal our appetite, they actually change our metabolism, the way we handle fats, all by these miraculous mighty microbes deep in the recess of our bowels, no pun intended, but they really, they really control us. Yeah, it's pretty profound. So if we can kind of drill down some of the mechanisms here, and again, you dive into this in your book, but we have a lot of people that ask questions, you know, so we have endotoxin, that bacterial appendage on gram negative bacteria, we have short chain fatty acids, there's uh, motility, what do you think are the some of the most powerful ways uh, as in, in terms of your perspective, that bacteria help our metabolism or help us burn fat better? What could you say about that? Well, a few things. Uh, first off, what happens is that the bacteria control in the local environment the integrity of the lining of the gut. And so when you do not have proper integrity, right, the bacterial bias, what you mentioned is endotoxin, that can actually leak into the bloodstream and signal an inflammatory response. And the aggressiveness of that response is going to really be predicated upon the load of the endotoxin and your own genetics and the health of your immune system. And so that inflammation itself, as you know, long-term, many degenerative diseases, if not all, have common thread of chronic inflammation. But in terms of weight metabolism, it also causes insulin resistance and really causes us to divert our, our energy into really more fat building than really muscle building. So that is one way the gut bacteria do it. The other way is through gut hormones that maybe we'll touch upon later. And the gut bacteria actually ferment our foods and help us ferment those fibrous foods and actually elicit the production of gut hormones like ghrelin that's made by the stomach and, and GLP-1, GLP-2 and peptide YY. These control our motility they also control the signaling of lipoprotein by protein lipase, and ultimately, they, they determine the way our appetite is signaled and ultimately what our metabolism is. So the bacteria have indirect effects, but they're profound effects on our metabolism. Really well said. I like how you phrase it, that it's really the bacterial shifts that drive inflammation due to a barrier defect and that in turn uh, affects our metabolism. And so we tend to think that everything's just metabolic based, but I like your approach is we're really getting at the root cause of these issues and that's inflammation. And I remember a study, it was in animals, but they gave these laboratory animals asthma medication, of course, just anti-inflammatory based medication and they lost weight. And so it was really, uh, that's something that we try to stress on the show here is it's not just about calories in, calories out, it's about inflammation. But a key component here that I've read, Dr. Mullen is, bacterial diversity. And one of the things that you talk about in your book for doing that is having more kefir and kimchi and so forth, but also fiber. So maybe talk to us about, you know, how fiber is revving up our gut bacteria and some of your favorite fiber sources. Okay. Very good. So diversity and biodiversity. When I think about diversity, one thing I think about is like a symphony. So if you go to your local uh, concert hall, and you see a, a four or five piece, uh, you know, uh, uh, musicians that are playing a concerto, it's very nice, but more profound if you have 30 or 40 in an orchestra, that has a very different tone and a very different effect, more powerful. And so I think of the microbiome in the same way with diversity is that you have all these different instruments and all these different types of, you know, players that are, are doing something different. And the symphony and the, and the totality of what happens is in, in the collection of that synergizes and produces a very important uh, physiological effect, let's say, in, in the gut, just like the music and the notes would have very profound and very you know synchronous effect on, on the harmony of the music. And so if you start reducing the biodiversity of the bacterium, you're reducing the type of functions or the metabolomics of those bacteria types. So if you only have five different types of bacteria, you have a very narrow spectrum of metabolomics, your physiology is going to really not, is going to suffer, right? And just like the sound, you may have a nice sound with those four or five players, but it's not going to certainly be the same as that full orchestra. 
So that's how I look at biodiversity is like the more you have, the more metabolomics and functioning you have, the better your health and better your resilience. And that's the key that comes up is resilience because the more resilient you are, the more you can take the hits and keep going, like from the, move, the Rocky movies. <laughs> you keep going. And in aging, those who do well and live long are able to take the little insults and little hits and not die or be in a hospital and they get wiped out is because their biome rebounds and it keeps going and it and helps your physiology. Yeah, let's pause right there and then talk about going on a gluten-free diet. And I've read some studies that show that when you get off these, um, you know, even grains, I know we we kind of vilify grains due to the immunological role that they uh, may have in a deleterious way in our body, but we know grains also provide fuel for the microbiome. And so studies have shown when people get off grains, their gut ecology shifts in a negative way. So, uh, and along those lines in your book, you talk about doing a short-term ketogenic diet. So maybe that will kind of answer the question right there. If you could explain that when we drop the grains, what happens and why do you recommend just a short-term ketogenic diet? Well, thank you. The reason why I recommend the short-term ketogenic diet, it's like a jumpstart. And we call it reboot, just like you reboot your system at home and your computers. And I do it here at work periodically. We reboot our system as a refresh to reset our metabolism. And once we start losing some weight with the ketogenic diet, and it's a high quality protein diet, and really the low carb part of it is the junk right? You're still getting, you know, good carbs. You're still getting fibrous vegetables, let's say, and good whole grains that are not not glutinous. And so the reason why I want to get a little bit on the ketogenic side, right, just on the border of of ketosis is so the person starts to feel the weight loss almost immediately, and they reverse the tide from weight gain into weight loss. And then they feel, and they have now new momentum, the momentum switch is immediate. They're not starving themselves at all. And it's a very short-term effect, maybe two, three, four weeks max. So they don't have to really get into this whole, oh my God, I'm on this Atkins diet. How am I going to do it? I got to do X and Y and Z. I'm going to starve to death. I'm going to have all this high fat. And sometimes in the, in the early Atkins days, they'd be eating cheeseburgers. And somehow that was part of the, you know, this healthy Atkins plan, right? So that's why I do that, you know, in the beginning. And what that does is by cutting the junk out is that you're going to increase the biodiversity just by taking these things out that normally reduce the biodiversity and the sugary refined grains and the things that, you know, are very bad for you. So that's kind of how, why I do that in the beginning. But would we not want to do that long-term? And and I guess the reason why I asked this, Dr. Mullen, is right now in the internet world and the CrossFit and everything, a lot of people are, are getting off the grains, you know, and, and I think they're missing out on a, a high fiber source. And I'm not a pro grain guy per se, uh, but you offer some nice um, alternative, you know, gluten-free type grains. So talk about the importance of these, these, um, you know, the phytonutrients uh, and also the fiber from, from grain-like products and, and how they fuel the growth of uh, bacteria. It's, it's a very good point. And one thing I, I mentioned is that the good colleagues, uh, Bill Davis and, and, and good friend David Perlmutter, uh, they believe that grains uh, can have some root causation in terms of problems. And I think there, although they see wheat as the common evil, um, and that raises other conversations about how the wheat is processed and, and the pesticides are being used that may have their own problems, right, that we see with gluten sensitivity. What I what I try to do in, in the way I look at grains is that the fibrous, non-glutinous grains, like quinoa is, 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 as you saw in the book, is one of the ones that I really promote. I mean, brown rice is great too. But when you look at a low glycemic index, high fibrous, high protein, you know, superstar, superfood, I mean, quinoa is really at the top of my list of of things that people underutilize, and it's delicious, and it goes in a lot of dishes. So, you know, and oats that are gluten-free, and and, uh, seal-cut oats in particular, I love. So I think grains, I think you got to have a varied diet and have a good mix. And I think the paleo people may not want to hear that because, you know, in the hunter-gatherer stage, we can talk about meat and game meat a little bit later on, perhaps. 
but you know they could make the argument well you know the caveman didn't really get into grains but you know i mean it's been in our lineage for how many years and i think good grains uh to a to a limited extent is good as a good carb for us um but if there's people who are having so many grain sensitivities explore the gut and see what's failing in there and see what's going on and you mentioned the you know the, the leaky gut and, and and those things and when i hear about f- multiple food sensitivities it kind of brings us back to that as a, as a suspect so i think grains are good to have i keep it down in the beginning of fa- the first phase when i reboot the gut um and low fodmaps as, as well we could talk about that is so we can keep the carbs low so you can start to get into ketogenesis and that and that's all I wanted to make a little bit of a stink about this and have you expand on that like you just did so that we can kind of segue into the study that you highlight in your book from one of your, your colleagues at Cleveland Clinic. And I love how you get into details about this. Uh, professor was using a George Foreman grill and giving students steaks. And basically what he saw is there's a difference in gut ecology. So why don't you share with us the details of that study so that meat eaters can kind of get a grasp of, you know, that they should eat more vegetables and, and the importance of that for their gut. You see, what's unfortunate is that, you know, meat has uh, conventional meat, you know, conventionally raised meat has some some issues worth discussing. And we'll get into the antibiotics, I hope, a little bit later, which is to me the prime issue I have. But meat itself, you know, they gave the hamburgers to the the med students, right? Um, They've done, med students, unfortunately, have been at at the wrong end of a lot of different studies that are not too healthy. But if you measure what goes on in the gut biome with red meat, it turns it into a less biodiverse, uh, let's say more pathogenic rich, uh, let's say uh, ecosystem that's unhealthy. And so what happens though, the interaction of that with let's say the carnitine in the meat starts to you know, produce TMAO and that in and of itself can really turn on cardiovascular disease. So we all kind of knew red meat was kind of a bad actor, you know, cardiovascular wise, and we all kind of blamed it on saturated fat in the meat, and it is pro-inflammatory, it's omega-6 rich. But now there's another factor is the gut biome then comes in and has something to say about that and facilitates cardiovascular disease just because you got a bad microbiome, you're eating this meat, you know, full of the carnitine, and if you ate the eggs and it had phosphatidylcholine, you're looking at a similar pathway. Um, and even though, you know, I mean, eggs have been demonized and now they're back, just like, you know, a lot of things that were fashionable years ago, one point margarine was supposed to be, you know, the greatest thing, but, you know, don't fool mother nature as that old commercial used to say. And, uh, you know, butter was obviously the, the better choice if it's grass fed. So the bottom line is that in that study, you're showing that you can facilitate TMAO production and thus cardiovascular disease through just feeding the red meat, which causes the biome to be dysbiotic and in itself, then the dysbiotic microbes then act on the meat and turn it into TMAO. It's a very fascinating study. That is fascinating. So, but and basically at the end of the day, what it showed is that vegans didn't have that same degree of formation of TMAO because their gut microbiome was different. Is that right? They were, the, the biome was better. Wow. I mean, it, it biodiversifies the biome. You, you have much, much less measurable TMAO. And that's why we see vegans do better in so many different metrics, mm-hmm. like vascular cancer, so on and so forth. And uh, so I, I, you know, people like to knock vegan diets and they would say, we got to go low carb, but you know, there's a lot of living proof that people who do eat very good carbs do quite well. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Fantastic. So provided that you know all this information and kind of have the inside track with all these different (laughs) doctors, (laughs) how much meat do you eat? Like break it down. What's your diet look like in terms of protein? That's funny. Um, very little. I should I should probably eat more. Um, in fact, they they did my my CBC this week. I saw my doctor for my annual or semi annual whatever, and I'm always like my hemoglobin is always like just like the one decimal point below the lowest you know range of normal, and it's kind of like ah just have another steak once in a while. It's kind of like for me once in a while it'd be like you know once a month or 
or, or twice a month, maybe it's very, it's very little. Wow. Uh, but I try to, you know, when I'm out, you know, and, and it's available, you know, whether it's grass fed or something like lamb or game, game meat, you know, something wild like that, then I'll have it. Um, but you know, when I'm out or, you know, when I'm home, I like to, I'm, I'm mainly like wild fish and things that are more lean and clean in that respect. But I don't eat a lot of red meat mm-hmm. to, a, to a fault, probably, you know, to a fault. <laughs> right. yeah. Now you were just in Europe recently. We were talking offline. You told me you were in Italy. So when you were in Italy, uh, did you eat any of the wheat? Yeah. I mean, you know, you're, you're there. They make their own pasta there. In other words, it's not like it's coming out of box. They do it right in a restaurant. Um, there was one place they were, it was like overkill with what they were doing with it. So I was kind of like passing on some dishes and just tasting, but uh, one place was phenomenal. But yeah, I mean, I had a little bit of the week cause you're there and you want to enjoy it. But you know, I mean, we probably have better bread here. I mean, but there it's really, I didn't have any pizza there, for example, but the pasta they do their own there and they, they have, they, they know exactly how to cook it. Right. But yeah. I had, I had the pasta. You're right. Love it. Fantastic. And yeah. along those lines in your book, you talk about the Baltic Sea diet, the Mediterranean diet. Maybe give us a highlight so people can uh, be a little bit more enlightened on why that's good for their gut. Okay. Very good. These are, <clears throat> I would say these are called heritage diets. And for people who want to look at line at always, are you familiar with always? No. Yeah. It's called old, like old ways, like we had old ways, oldways.com. They have the Mediterranean pyramid. They have the Mediterranean diet. They have you know, a very interesting uh, foundation, which is really trying to bring back some of these heritage diets. So they actually have a pyramid that I put in the book in, in, in the third phase, the maintenance phase, the Mediterranean diet. I talk about the Baltic diet, but they have pyramids in, in their site. But in any event, I put it that in the book. The Mediterranean diet, as you know, is longstanding, has multiple studies, cardiovascular impacts, no question, lion heart study. But what's more interesting is in the last month that we've seen, uh, with, you know, literature and, and, and posted on Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera, is cognitive decline it prevents, it improves cognition, improves brain function. It seems to have uh, cancer protection it has a lot of benefit through its anti-inflammatory and prebiotic qualities. So when I designed phase three and kept a lot of these in mind, it seems like the diet to have for life, you know, it's more about having wild fish, omega-3 rich, you know, game meat, um, eggs and dairy for those who can tolerate that, good whole grains. It's very diverse in its own right, but it's healthy and anti-inflammatory. And in the, the, you know, the third phase of my maintenance phase of the diet, I mean, you have such a resilient microbiome. You could, you know, on the seventh day, you could rest, no pun intended. You could go out and have your Sunday meal. You can you socialize. You can go to your holiday party. You can, you know, you're going to take that hit and, and the next day your biome's going to bounce back. So I think that's really why I chose that as your maintenance diet. Mm-hmm. And we know that those diets are rich in color, phytonutrients, and we've talked a lot up to now about fiber and different, you know, fermentable foods. You like kimchi and sauerkraut and a yeah. bunch of these different things, yogurt. We know the, the color, those phytonutrients have an effect on the microbiome and the bacteroides. You want to get into that a little bit? Yeah, the, the basically the um, polyphenols in particular are prebiotic. They help build up and biodiverse the microbiome. And for example, a lot of the fruits like the berries in particular that I emphasize throughout the phases is that they're low glycemic, low FODMAP, meaning that they're not really highly fermentable in respect that they're going to cause a lot of symptoms and gas and bloating, and that they will, with their phytonutrients, fight disease, prevent cancer, and enrich the microbiome all in one. So they're truly a, an incredible superfood that I have really in all three phases as an example. Yeah, yeah. Love that info. And um, one aspect of the book, I guess we haven't really talked about up to now would be uh, dysbiosis. You highlight dysbiosis a lot in the book and you have some, some cool charts and diagrams. So, so maybe talk about maybe digestive dysfunction and dysbiosis and some takeaways that people can uh, implement you know, in their life to improve their gut ecology. See, 
you know, our bodies are meant to have a very low burden of bacteria in our upper digestive system. And we're meant to have a nice, rich mix of anaerobes and aerobes that really start to increase as our gut gets closer to the colon. Obviously, the most rich uh, source and place for that is all in the colon. And so what happens over time is that we're supposed to really be able to sweep out the bacteria in our upper digestive system. And we have hydrochloric acid, we have digestive enzymes and bile and pancreatic enzymes, and all those things keep the bacterial burden low down. Now, we could talk about a number of ways that we can, you know, have these systems off, right, with these proton pump inhibitors or just with gastroparesis, a slowing of our system, other medications that slow down our gut, um, or with pancreatic insufficiency. There's ways by which we don't have those protective defenses in the upper gut. The bacteria build up. And in that case, we have SIBO or small bowel overgrowth, which is an example of dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is really an abnormal population of microbes that colonize a particular area of the body. And we can have dysbiosis on our skin. We could have dysbiosis in our general urinary tract. But particularly, we have dysbiosis in our gut because that's where 90% of our microbes are. Right. And, and when we have that dysbiotic mix, that's when we set the stage for disease. Interesting. Now, you t- talk about in the book, uh, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Do you see that in a much higher prevalence in overweight individuals? And I believe feel that that's a contributing cause. Would you? Is that accurate from what I inferred? Yeah, there is a, a particular one study that I cite in the book about IBS that two-thirds of individuals who are overweight or obese have the symptomatology of IBS-like symptoms. One study was talking about gastric bypass surgery, and they measured that they had SIBO. They actually gave the lactobacillus caseri, one of the probiotics which made the SIBO get much better, right? So we know that patients even post-bypass because of the blind limb, and also patients who have overweight and, and, and obesity appear to have, they clearly have dysbiosis. There, there is many studies and meta-analysis about dysbiosis, and particularly with firmicutes, was, which is a fat-forming phylum. I mean, there's a lot of Fs there, but, but fat-forming phylum or, 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 or strain of bacteria, uh, as opposed to the bacteroidetes that you had just mentioned before, um, uh, with bifidobacteria as an example of an organism that's really a, a, a lean, lean metabolizing microbe. So once we have this biosis inside, that's going to really foster fat-forming types of metabolism, and that's where that's why we pay attention to dysbiosis. Now, what what are the top reasons why people get dysbiosis? I mean, you, you talked about some of the clinical issues, gastroparesis, pancreatic insufficiency, but are there other lifestyle factors? I know you're not a fan of eating late. You know, maybe we can weave that in. Like, what are some things that if you could say to someone listening and are driving their car right now yeah. to, to not do to avoid dysbiosis or SIBO? Well, there you go. I mean, you, you mentioned the, the eating late and the gut clock. I mean, the gut clock is kind of our bodies go through a circadian rhythm of just cleansing the upper digestive tract and sweeping everything kind of towards the end. And uh, in order to do that, it's kind of like going to a football game. And after the football game, you know, the stands are pretty littered and and someone's got to come in and sweep it all towards the field or like you ever see it on TV where it's snowing and there's like in Buffalo and they get two feet of snow or in New England this winter and everybody's got to sweep it down and try to clear the field. But what if they didn't do that with the litter and then all of a sudden you you walk in next time, it's going to build and it's going to build and you're going to have a proliferation or overgrowth of that junk. And that happens in the gut, right? So if you're going to eat like 11 o'clock at night, so like when I was in Italy and they'd say, we'll pick you up 8 o'clock at night. And I'm saying, what, for a dessert or a cappuccino? No, for dinner. And I'm saying to myself, you got to be kidding me. Um, but that's that's the custom. You know, one night it was like seven and it was done well. You didn't have to wait a long time for your dinner. It was good, good food. Um, second night, a uh, little different story. Eight o'clock at night, it was all rich. You felt like, you know, you know, you could carry your digestive enzymes that night, you know. But in any event, if you're eating late, um, 
you're going to stress your body, especially a high quantity, you're going to stress the body's systems to digest and clear that food before you go to bed. So unless you're kind of working a night shift and you're going to be up all night for whatever reason, um, don't do it. I mean, you really shouldn't have anything heavy after six, no more than seven o'clock at night if you have a very strong you know, digestive system in for terms of turning around food pretty quickly. Um, but four or five hours before sleep should be it. Unless you're just snacking on grazing on something. You know, I've got nuts here. I keep that here. I kind of, we could talk about grazing and skipping meals and all that. But but anyway, so if you graze a little bit and have some tea, that's fine. Your, your gut will clear it out relatively quick. You don't want to have a buildup, right? Just like you don't want to have buildup in your teeth with plaque. You don't want to build that up in your upper digestive system or else you're going to have SIBO for sure. And dysbiosis later, you know, later on in the gut. Mm -hmm. So basically what I infer from that is we're all susceptible to SIBO at some level if we participate in, you know, the American lifestyle, eat late, stay up late, eat high fermentable foods and so forth. Oh, yeah, especially with the American diet, the Western diet, which is high in saturated fats and refined sugars and carbs and refined flours and all those things the bad bugs love. And so you will reduce your biodiversity. You will have less of your bifidobacter and all the good guys. And then basically it turn, you turn your gut from a very thriving garden into a cesspool. Mm -hmm. And you call it the fat forming firmicutes. Those are the fat bugs. They, they, they proliferate. In fact, Dr. Gary Wu at University of Pennsylvania showed within 24 hours, you can, you can really mess up a good gut just with the Western diet. Wow. So don't supersize me. <laughs> that guy's got to look like, I mean, he looked horrible, you know, uh, in, in many respects, but, but at the end he, you know, I would hate to see what his, uh, microbiome looked like. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, well, I think the only thing we really didn't cover that, that I know is an emerging topic and you talk about in your book is the gut hormones, uh, and maybe, you know, the meal skipping, we know breakfast eaters have changes in their gut hormones and so forth. So maybe give us the inside track on gut hormones and some key messages that people can key takeaways, I suppose. Well, I think the idea there is that the fiber we eat get converted by the bacteria into short chain fatty acids. And so they're an energy source. They help heal the colon and keep the integrity and the lining in check. They're anti-inflammatory, anti-neoplastic. But there is receptors called GP4143 in the gut that recognize the short-chain fatty acids. And then they in turn elicit these signals which inhibit low, low lipoprotein lipase. But they also signal peptide YY and these other GLP-1, GLP-2 to really slow motility and tell the brain, hey guys, we're doing good here. Our appetite, we're getting full. This is cool, right? So you get these reflexes in play and that's where a lot of our appetite comes in. If you eat a low fiber diet and have low short chain fatty acids, then you're not really utilizing your body's reflexes through these gut hormones to signal your brain to kind of chill, you know, and, and, and stop eating. Now, Another thing that I just remembered worth mentioning is the fact that we have so much antibiotics in, 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 in our society. We have now, you know, certainly the executive actions on antibiotics because of superbugs, and there's an initiative to reduce antibiotics in, in, in poultry in particular, but also meats, because we know how it's overused in poultry and livestock because it was given to prevent diseases in them in the 1940s, but they really saw the growth curve shoot up after the use of antibiotics, so it became mainstream. In fact, it's so measurable in their meat, so we know that the amount of antibiotics that you actually are consuming is enough to turn you fat because doctors Blazer and Marty, uh, Marty Blazer and Dr. Cho from NYU did the studies to show they gave these mice who had a normal microbiome the, a tiny amount of antibiotics, which is the amount in that you and I would consume two to three portions in a week if we did so. I don't do so, but if we did so, that amount of antibiotics is enough to make that mouse fat on, on a gram per gram basis. 
So it's not like we're flooding the, the, the mice with antibiotics. We're giving just a tiny amount on a weight basis. So we know the antibiotics, even in our milk supply, because the USDA kind of polices, you know, that and 90% of the time people comply with it. But what about the other 10% that's out there that you're getting antibiotics in your milk? And you're certainly getting in your in your meat. And if you're a meat eater and it's not organic and it's not certified antibiotic free, this is this is ruining your gut. So now there's an initiative because of superbugs and C. difficile and all that. That's the reason. It's not that antibiotics have are overused, which they are. The government's flipping it around saying we got to control, we have antibiotic shortages, we're having a superbug problem. But the problem is, is that the more antibiotics we give our children, the chances are they're going to become obese. There's studies showing that now. So we know that's a risk factor, but that's not the thing that's being really magnified. What's being magnified is that we're having shortages and that the fact that, you know, we have super bugs. We're not hearing about the other. That we're, This is one of the reasons why we're becoming such a quote unquote big nation. Mm-hmm. And I believe it. And Marty Blazer believes it. And, 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 and there's so many others that, that are, 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 you know, in this, this, this genre that believe exactly the same thing. It's all about messing up the biome. This is what's getting us fat to, to a large extent, unfortunately. Yeah, it's too bad. And I've read about the antibiotics and I didn't realize there were some publications back in 1964, I believe, and they gave military recruits antibiotics to fatten them up so that they can make the physical. So we know them for a long time that antibiotics cause weight gain. And um, and I think meat can be a double whammy, you know, because I've read about endotoxin in some of this commercially prepared meat and it's not uh, killed by heat. So you can get some junky meat loaded with antibiotics and it's loaded with endotoxin and it's a, a double whammy. So um, anymore, I'm eating a lot more and more vegetables and less meat and uh, actually have a lot more energy and mental focus. So interesting stuff there, Dr. Mullen. Now you have this great book that's coming out June 9th. So by the time you all see this, this is going to be live available on Amazon. And any key takeaway messages that you would like to share with our audience before we go to final questions about the book and your pl- practice? No, I, I think it's, you know, there we come to the age, as Rodney Dangerfield, the gut had no respect, you know, no respect. Now the science has really confirmed the practice and tradition of Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, and now naturopathic medicine and functional medicine is that the gut is, is, is a force to be reckoned with. And the microbiome is this invisible... I don't know if you if, if you ever watched, uh, i trying to remember the name of the show years ago with David Duchovny, but it was all about like aliens. And, and, and now, you know, certainly we have um, with Keanu Reeves, what's that, the Matrix? Right. It's like we're in this invisible world. We're surrounded by microbes. We just can't see them, right? So we're in this altered reality. So we got these hundreds of trillions of microbes in us that are actually controlling us. There's a gut brain axis. They control our thoughts, believe it or not, our moods, behaviors, what, you know, what we eat, actually what we, what we like in terms of, you know, our, um, the kind of foods, you know, our food selection is that we have this, the science is there that the gut is something that we need to concentrate on to really get ourselves healthy and, you know, it, it really drives our core physiology. So this book really is about the gut, but it's about health. It's about a lot of things. It's just not about weight loss. And by really shifting the biome, which shouldn't be done abruptly by just dousing people with probiotics, you have to shift the biome and you want it to be sustainable. You want to have a healthy life, a vibrant life, and you want to feel fit and lean just, just like you. Right, right. Looking you, looking you on the screen, you look like you could do at least a hundred push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go this afternoon. I'll try. I'll, I'll email right. you. Guys, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think we're on the precipice of a, a huge shift here, and I think you know, children and, and future medical students, uh, 20, 30 years from now, are gonna look back at uh, us and you know, and kind of laugh and, and think that uh, you know, because when we talk about medications now, even metformin, metformin changes gut ecology and that or the and affects gut hormones. And so I meet with a lot of doctors, talk with a lot of doctors, and I think people are still in the mindset, uh, you know, the gut's there, but they think of the gut in the terms of probiotics and this and that. So I love that, 
you're bringing this conversation to, like you just said, the main mainstream and allowing people to understand that we're, we're more microbe than human and they're controlling us, not the other way around. So, so funny, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Great, great discussion. I mean, could you imagine being a medical student, uh, you know, a hundred years from now, they're going to look back at us and just giggle. I agree. I agree. <laughs> so, all right, let's go to some final questions here. One thing we like to ask every guest on the show, Dr. Mullen, is uh, morning routines. You have a great breakfast routine that is good for your gut bacteria. So maybe if you could share with us what that looks like and a few tips on that. Yeah, what I do, um, as, as you as you know, I like yogurt. And the yogurt I like, which not to mention brands, is got 90 billion CFUs per serving. So this is the real deal. It comes in a glass jar, um, probably not widely distributed through the country. It, it's New York State based, if I believe, if I remember correctly. But I have that with some kefir because I mean kefir is just loaded with very good microbes and and it tends to be quite fresh. And this is all organic and grass fed. And then I'll have like berries. I like blueberries or raspberries and walnuts. Sometimes, as you just saw, they're almonds, but I like to snack on the almonds. And sometimes I'll throw a little, you know, ground flax on it or chia, and uh, voila, that's uh, that's my gut uh, bolstering meal for the for the morning at least. Yeah, that's going to really enrich your uh, diversity there. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Now, if you were to go out to a restaurant, what would you recommend people order? Oh, that that is that's a difficult question. Everybody's got different likes, different tastes. But let me tell you, I I, I go a lot to a place called Stone Mill Bakery in Baltimore. And I go in there and I start saying, I like this salad and maybe the chicken soup, but not the noodle. And and then I, I love their salmon because uh, the guy Alfie, the owner, he gets it from the market himself and he's very particular and so on and so forth. So after a while of hearing my own kind of improvisations, they just said, we're gonna make your, you're gonna have a Jerry salmon salad Jerry salmon super salad, and they've even made a key on a register for me. Wow. So some people walk in and said, "I want this guy's salad because they'll see me eating." I said, "That looks good. It's like off menu." So that's kind of what I like. I mean, I like different things, but if I had like a favorite thing, they all know in, in this area of the country. That's that's my baby. Mm-hmm. Super Fantastic. salad. They have pickled cucumbers. Um, sprouts that are cut up in broccoli and all kinds of greens and, uh, you know, mescaline and, uh, and and my salmon. I'll have olive oil on it. I'll squeeze some lemon. Sometimes I'll have some goat cheese or sometimes I'll have avocado. It's just, you know, I mean, but that's, that's kind of like what, you, what you're looking at. Yeah, I love it. Thanks yeah. for getting into the detail there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're making me hungry. I'm a detailed guy. Just look at that book. Yeah, it's very detailed, very thick. I'm holding it right now. Uh, so speaking of detail, let's let's get into supplements. And one thing we like to ask every guest on the show is what their, what is their favorite herb, nutrient, or botanical? And you don't have to mention names, but something that you think that a lot of people would really benefit from and you recommend and possibly take yourself. What is that and why? Well, even I do take, um, like, I do take, let's say, a multi, that's, I wouldn't say antioxidant, but there's, it's a combination of herbs and natural products that downregulate NF kappa B, because NF kappa B is is a, a signal transduction that mediates inflammation. So if you want to cut down inflammation, a lot of things do it, like green tea and vitamin D and curcumin and boswellia. And, you know, the list can go on about the things that do it. That baby, that's got a mix of all of these. But if I was ever stuck on a desert island. I would say the one spice that I would have would be turmeric. So curcumin, I think, is cool. It, it, it's it been shown, uh, turmeric, curcumin, curry, however you want to put it, uh, cardiovascular disease, prevent cancer, diabetes. I mean, inflammatory bowel disease, it's profound. I mean, the literature on especially curcumin, because obviously people look at the purified form because they can control for what's in it, on a scientific level, that's the one you don't want to be without. 
Yeah, I love it. Well, a, a lot of you uh, listening probably shop at Whole Foods or a local co-op. And many of these stores, these you know organic natural food stores, sell the turmeric root. And it's great to cook with and put in your stir fry and your meat if you are going to have it or your salad, uh, smoothies. It's, it's amazing. You can get it from all different directions and angles and uh, try to have it daily. So great tip there, Dr. Mullen. Now, the final question would be if you were to bump shoulders with a congressman, maybe Barack Obama or, or uh, someone, the future president, perhaps, what sort of health or lifestyle tip would you share with them? And uh, maybe, you know, under the assumption that they would uh, implement policy around it uh, in the future, what would you tell them and why? Well, one thing that is a frustration for many of us is the fact that the foods that are the most healthy are the least affordable. And the foods that are the least healthy are the most affordable. So it's easy for someone to go to McDonald's, sorry to bring up a brand, or, or go to a fast food restaurant um, and order pizza. I mean, it's easy to really take in a lot of bad foods, to destroy your biome that are highly glycemic and get you sick. Very easy to live on that. Very hard to live on a healthy whole foods diet, depending on your your you know your level of income or your motivation to do so, right? Because these are convenience foods. No you know no pun intended, but that's what what people do. So if there was a way to bump shoulders with somebody, and it's kind of funny, very funny story. I'll keep it short. Is that there was there was a point where I was I was in Baltimore City, and I was leaving a, a church service, and. Uh, and there was a lady who was sitting kind of like on the steps and she was grabbing her ankle and she said, sir, can, can you be so kind to help me? And I said, why, what happened? She said, I fell and I think I broke my ankle. So she wanted me to carry her around the corner to the hospital. I didn't want to do that. And then, you know, after a while she said, will you please stay with me? She made a phone call and she said, within two minutes, this, this street will be blocked off. I said, okay. I said, whatever. I didn't recognize her, right? And I said, she said, do you know who I am? And I said, you look familiar. She goes, yeah, I'm Senator Barbara McCluskey. And I said, okay. I said, I, I've seen you on TV, so and so. That Then after a few minutes, she goes, now, have you ever had a question you want to <laughs> ask your senator? And this is what, this is where we're going. So, so it's kind of like there's a farm bill. Right. So I've been to years ago when when Andy Weil had his conference, you know, out in California and Michael Pollan was there. So so they were talking about the farm bill. You know, Andy was was big. Mark Hyman is and, and Dean Ornish. And so there is a way that work just through our taxes, just given big farm, you know, they're getting money to really make GMO rich products and all these glycemic fast food junk that are the ingredients for fast food junk that are making us unhealthy and they're very affordable. We're doing nothing to help the little farmer who's making the real, the local farmer, right? When I go to my Whole Foods, there is the asparagus that I love from the local farmer where I go to the market. When I, when I, when I went more often, we have a beautiful market in Baltimore. Um, those people need help. They're not getting it. So it's, it's just, that's that's where the frustration is. And I think that's where we can make a difference and, and you know, rise above the politics. And, and we talk about, you are know, throwing money in all kinds of aimless directions towards obesity and hoping that it sticks. But there's some fundamental things that we can change that we're not changing. And that's the messaging that I would give if I had someone's ear, just like I just had her ear that day and now she follows me on Facebook. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Gosh, like, what a great. Yeah, I I I I I um I sent a message to her about six months ago. She called me Sir Galahad for, for helping her. I said it's me, Sir Galahad. Remember me? Remember the conversation we had? She goes, Are you interested in the kind of thing I'm doing? She follows me. And then she'll wow. once in a while she'll comment about a post. So this is this is interesting. You never know how how you meet you know a politician these days? So they they want maybe they can follow you on Facebook. You can get a message across. Right. Oh man, that's amazing. Thanks for getting into that 
yeah. That Good detail is great. Our listeners are going to love that. And uh, thanks for doing that great work. And what a serendipitous, you know, interaction there that uh, hopefully will lead to a great relationship and improve the lives of others. So Dr. Mullen, I know our listeners are going to want to reach out to you, learn more about your book and your clinical practice. So what's the best online resources that they can check you out on? I have a, a, a new site I just relaunched this week. It's called thefoodmd.com. That's, that's it. It's got everything on it that's about me. Perfect. Professional. Yes. <laughs> Professional. <laughs> yeah. No, I got you. And you got all, all the Facebook links and so forth. And I'll also post the show notes in the, vi- the video version of this interview. So if you're listening to this while you're driving or at the gym, you can go to highintensityhealth.com slash GR Mullen. Now I have links to the Amazon uh, storefront so you can buy his book and download that on your Kindle or the hardcover like I have. So Dr. Mullen, keep up the good work and thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, nice talking to you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mike. Thanks.